to go hello everyone welcome to another episode of tales from the forlorn dopes i am your host cyber smiley with my co-host i am wisdom uh i am so happy to be here today greetings programs um i think we're just gonna you know get right into it um we have a special guest today ross Wynn, a prolific writer for art Alsorian games uh, he wrote some of the best books out there, and he wrote uh, Neo Tribes, parts of uh, Solo of Fortune, Listen Up, You Primitive Screwheads. I mean, many of the Chromebooks he he contributed to. He's he's the man. Yes, yes. Well, I don't know if I'm the man, but I used to work <laughs> for the man. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, we can get into it. Um, first off, Ross, have you? played it all with uh, Cyberpunk 2077, or is that something that you're, you're not a computer gamer anymore? I'm, I'm really, you know, I've never really been a huge computer gamer. Um, I, you know, I, I really enjoy stuff like RTS games and Builders games. I mean, the last <laughs> the last video game I played all the way through was uh, Myst. Oh, I yep. mean, it, it's been a long time. And, you know, yeah, I really think that the kind of storytelling that I wanted, you know, and no no offense to any of my friends who work in the industry, and there's a lot of them, including a lot of guys that we work with at RTG, but um, that's not the kind of storytelling that I want to do. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So I, I just, I, when, uh, when 27, seven, I get a lot of, I got a lot of phone calls. Um, I got a lot of, of messages and it's funny too, because right when that was all starting to happen was right when I had gotten out of, uh, of rehab and I'd gotten out of the halfway house. And, um, in case anybody in the program doesn't know, I'm in recovery. I have been for, for a little over five years. It's been fantastic. But you know, when all that happened, like I was literally, I was less than a year clean and you know, people kept out, you know, hey do you want to do this or do you want to do that and um everybody wanted me to sign something or you know whatever and i just told him i said you know guys it's, it's not what i want to do right now it's right. not you know where i want to go um you know i even got some calls from some people that used to work at our tg saying hey are you interested in you know doing this or doing that and you know honestly today the answer is no not right. Not because I don't love the game, but because I've got other priorities. Right. Okay. Yeah, life moves fast. Yeah. Oh, very much so. <clears throat> um, my grandson just turned 16 years old. Holy and, uh, cow. When I started, <laughs> when I Christ, started can't, working. You can't drop that on us like that. Listen, when I started working on um, on Cyberpunk, um, it was 1990. One, um, my daughter was 11. She's 36 now. So, don't, and my don't remind us how old we old. are. We, I mean, that is basically the premise of our show is how very old we are. But damn, that hurts. Well, it's it, it's funny, and you guys, the name of your show is Tales from with, with the Forlorn Dope. So, you know, I've known Frank Fry, the original author of Tales of the Forlorn Hope since i was 13 years old that's 41 years damn oh damn you need to hook me up with him yeah we would like he, to you know i to remember him. i remember when when he wrote the rdf source book for twilight 2000 um i also remember when when uh tom mulkey god rest his soul uh wrote uh wrote the last university for uh, for twilight as well and all of that 
there was a lot of that stuff that happened around here and i was very fortunate when when we moved here in 1979 from about 1980 until about 1990 i got to see a lot of very cool stuff being developed um right I, whether I, it was moral project I, 2000 all that stuff and then and then i woke up one day and we were playing Traveler, and I woke up one day, and uh, I had read Neuromancer the night before. I said, hey, wait, I can do this in a game. And I couldn't. Yeah. I, I, I figured out I couldn't do it. And then uh, in 1988, um, another friend who I still talk to on a regular basis uh, brought a black box copy of Cyberpunk 2013 to our local convention. And we sat down and played, and I'm like, oh, this is what I'm looking for. The lights came on. The heavenly choir sounded. So, are you still gaming the today? Empire and Dirty Alley. I mean, however it works out. For yeah. Me. I went home and picked the game apart, and um, I wrote Derek Quentin our letter. He was the he was the line editor at the time, um, pretty much for the whole time. 2020 was published, um, and. Uh, and he said, uh, do you like this game or not? I can't tell. I said, oh, I like it. I just want it to be internal, internally consistent. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then he gave me a 90,000 word contract for uh, Land of the Free. Wow. Damn. Um, That's cool. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, so anyway. Um, uh, well, just to list off at least some of the, the credits you've had is uh, Chromebook 2, Chromebook 3, Chromebook 4, Home of the Brave, Land of the Free as a playtester, Listen Up You Primitive Screwheads, which I think is probably everyone's favorite. Um, it, it, should from, be on, it should be on every gamer's shelf, yeah, period. You, you were Maximum Metals playtester slash developer. You did Neuro Tribes, yeah. or Neo Tribes, Solo Fortune 2, which you were actually a, a model for Blackhand, um, Wild Side, well, you, yeah. were, you were a play tester. Um, was there any other books that you were involved with? Because those are the uh, only ones I saw that I know you worked on for... uh, Comeo Foe for uh, Castle Frank uh, Frankenstein. Or I worked on Comeo Foe. I worked on some stuff for Mechton. I worked on Protect and Serve for Cyberpunk as well. Um, and there are, um, you know, one of the things that made everything that we did during that time at, at RTG so great was the incredible number of people that were involved and the talent of all of them, you know. I think Benjamin Wright is a fantastic writer and way better than I, I agree. Am. And um well maybe not uh, better thanks. than you are, but he's fantastic. Thanks. Um but uh you know we had we had Benjamin um you know, Chris Williams, who was the warehouse manager, is probably a better writer than all of us. And maybe including Mike. I mean, if you ever read, he, he redid Dreamlands for Call of Cthulhu, I think 10 or 12 years ago anyway. Um, and it was, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, the, Ackerman, um, you know, the... Alex Okita, um, Ed Balme, Will um, Moss. I'm trying to yeah. think of everybody. I mean, you know, Gilbert Chris was about time as well. Yeah, Chris Hawk about. Although I never met Chris during that time, I met him later. Um, hmm. And I think Chris is the artist who did. And I've never met Paolo Parente either. Um, I think. Hockabout it's amazing to me how how far Paolo wins. Like he, he went yeah. on to work in the big leagues. Paolo, Eric Heiser, <laughs> who worked on "Listen Up, You Primitive Screwheads," is an Oscar-winning screenwriter. Oh shit! I did not know that. He won an Oscar for adapted screenplay for *The Arrival*. Huh? Wow! That's. I I, I knew he was doing movies. My mind is blown know. on that. No, he was. Uh... Well, yeah, he did. He did the reboot of Friday the Thirteenth. Yep. Did Final Destination Five. He's he's done a bunch of movies. Um, he worked his way up as a strip doctor, and then whatever. And now, now he's he's the guy. Wow. You know, we can all carry water for him forever. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, he's the one who really made it of all of us. Um, but, you know, and just but that incredible group of talented individuals, because there are pieces of me in, in a lot of books, probably. And there are pieces of, of everybody else in there, too. I mean, whether I got credit or somebody else got credit or something. You know, one of the funniest things is um, I think it was Chromebook three. So there's a um, there's an EMP rifle. Yeah, the and, uh, yeah, Chromebook two or Chromebook three. There's an EMP rifle in the book, and you want to talk about a, a five of us sent in almost the exact same stats for that weapon, completely <laughs> unknown to anybody else. We'd all extrapolated that that's what it would do, and it was almost exactly the same. But, you know, when you have that sort of, when you're all coming from the same gestalt, you know, when you when you all have the same sources of the same, the same ideas, and they come up and they bubble up, and then you come up with this thing, it's never yours. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, always it's part of a larger whole. You know, a, but you, it becomes a somebody, hive mind. Oh yeah, or you know, and and you t and then you've got other writers that were that were tangentially related to cyberpunk. I mean, guys like Lucian, um, you know, who you know is probably ten times the writer I, I would ever have been. Um, and, and you know, he's in the computer game industry now, and there's a bunch of other people as well. But um, there was a lot of us, and we had a lot of fun doing something that we were all very invested in and we all really wanted it to go well and i'm glad that people still think now 25 years later that it was successful right so well so i have a question because this is like you know pre-internet right and how did you guys collaborate yes. i mean was it just phone calls did did you guys meet like at all or well, was it just correspondence like in person yeah it wasn't quite pre-internet. Um, it was pretty close, especially toward the end. Um, there were, used to be a software program called Hotline, which was originally developed for the Macintosh. But, um, bro, uh, not to interrupt, I just got a message saying that the uh, audio is a little distorted. Um, yeah. Hold on one second. Let's see what I. The only, I don't know. Is it from us? Hold on, I can shut down some things. Give Hold me on. one second. Well, it, it could be my computer, right? Because I'm pulling in, <laughs> I'm hosting this, I'm broadcasting it, and I'm also like watching the the chat. So I can. A lot of things are going through my bandwidth that I can probably eliminate, <laughs> for now. Hopefully, it'll improve the the quality. Let's see if this works. It's on Spike's audio specifically. So oh, yeah. The, the, yeah, Spike, you you just seemed a little garbly. Um, but maybe... Hello? Hello? Can you hear us? Spike? Spike? Uh-oh, we got some technical difficulties, folks. Give us... Be patient. We're not going anywhere. It's a bunch of old men trying to figure out technology. <laughs> With this interwebs and all the tubes it has. Hello? Hello. Hello. Can you hear, can you hear us? us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can, and I think I can. you're a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, what was your question? Uh, how how you guys collaborated? Um, because yes. Oh, that's right. So you, there used to. Go ahead. Yeah, there used to be this program called Hotline for the Macintosh, and it was basically a client server, very primitive client server application and several of us could collaborate on that um on article ideas and asking opinions and stuff like that um 
And actually, uh, in the middle of, of doing something, I can't remember which article it was, but I got locked out of my server and uh, I couldn't figure out how to get back in. And uh, because of a funny course of events, that's how I met my third wife. Um, <laughs> because she was working in technical assistance at Hotline. She was the support manager um, at the time. And uh, But uh, so we had that and we had the web, we had like Netscape one and two and you know we had some of that stuff i think the first time i got an email address was 1994 um and i think it was a netcom address hmm. <laughs> damn that's going back yeah uh it was a long time ago but i mean a lot of phone calls um a lot of uh, you know, people meeting at conventions, coming together, um, at, you know, at, either at, at RTG or somewhere else in Berkeley or, you know, it was just a little bit of everything, you know. Uh, one guy, I can't, it was his name, his name wasn't Ben, what was his name? Um, he was one of the authors of, um, Because Eric Heiserer, I only communicated with by mail. And um, there was another guy doing um, stuff for Listen Up, You Primitive Screwheads. And I only, I, basically, we got a completed manuscript from him. And I, nobody really had any um, cross pollinization with him. Hmm. I'm trying to remember what his name is. Can't it remember. all seems like it was such a tight knit like group when when you read the books. There's, uh, it just seems like you guys were like constantly collaborating with each other. Yeah, and I think well, that... for a long time, Benjamin Wright ran a cyberpunk campaign, and it was Mark Schumann, um, who was an art director at RTG, um, Alex Okita, myself. Um, Con Smith and um, there's one other player and I'm blanking on who it was but um, I mean we were literally playing together every week um, Damn. which is one of the cooler campaigns I've ever played in um, not just because of the people who were in it but because um, Benjamin was such a fantastic game master. He went on to write Wild Side, which dollar for dollar, I think is probably the best cyberpunk supplement there is. Um, but I will admit a certain bias. Um, I, I don't want to name any of my own works because I really, you know, I look at them now and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I wrote that. But <laughs> I, I think every writer does that. Yeah. I mean, um, I was talking to Dan Moran um, um, about a year ago, and um, and we were talking about something in uh, in Emerald Eyes, and um, and he's like, "Oh, I can't believe I did that!" And it was so funny. I just started laughing, and he's, you know, because every writer does it. Doesn't matter who it is. I'm sure Gregory Benford does it. Um, who just had. A a stroke I heard and I hope he's well or you know I'm sure Carl Sagan did it too you know where they look back at something they wrote and goes oh my god I can't believe I wrote that you know we all but, do. Uh, watch any Stephen King interview where he talks about you know uh, maximum overdrive <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah I mean but the check clear you know that, the check clear <laughs> you know I mean that's a that's a super super you know uh, somebody asked uh Michael Caine about Jaws 4 and what an incredible piece of crap it was and he said I understand that but the money purchased a lovely villa in the south of France and I go there every year and it's wonderful bought his mama house so, yeah you know so he you know it is what it is so we all we all gotta we all gotta find our own way so all right well since since you opened that door uh and talked about, you know, the early days at Art Talsorian. Um, what I've always wanted to know is, uh, we know you were a, a massive contributor, but and now we found out that you're, you were part of 
a gaming group with Mike and with Benjamin Wright and Alex Okita and, you know, so on. Can, can you give us any insight into who played what NPCs? Um, well, it's, it's funny that you would say that because, um, in that, in that game, I played a character, um, called Frank Trax, who was a heroin addict, who, um, who was based on Eric Bogosian, um, uh, who is, uh, or, or was a talk radio host at the time. Um, and he was a rocker boy journalist. Um, and, uh, you know, but all of us got sort of assigned. I mean, uh, uh, Ed was Rach Bartmoss, you know, uh, who, who? you know, uh, uh, Ed Bolme. Ed Bolm. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, was, was, was Rach and, um, and then, um, Benjamin was Adam Smasher and, and, um, really? Yeah. Like yeah. Adam Smasher um, goes back that far? Well, yeah, Adam. Well, see, that's where a lot of this stuff comes, and and you know, a lot of this stuff that you know seems like it springs, you know, fully formed from the head of Zeus is actually stuff we all use in our own campaigns. Well, and I yeah, think that's I always, true of other people too. I mean, George R. R. Martin. I always figured that. Along. I just <laughs> um, Smasher didn't like show up in the books until Chrome or until Solo of Fortune too. So. That's actually yeah. really surprising well, uh, to me that he'd been around much longer than that in the game. Well, I mean, he, you know, he was he was a, a he he came from Benjamin, you know, um, you know, Rach existed, but really came from Ed um, because if you if you knew Ed and you knew his style, those go together. Um, you know, uh, I had a, a character that's in Home of the Brave, um, or no, it's Land of the Free. Um, who's a Jesuit um, named Jack Maximum. That comes from my original cyberpunk campaign called No One to Love that I wrote in 1988. Um, uh, the vampire Elton, who is mentioned uh, in there as well, is uh, is my late and very good friend, um, Elton Ammons, um, who, uh, who unfortunately committed suicide some time ago. Um, but I mean, all of those people, you know, people come up with NPCs and different things, and they're really just people in their lives, or they're people they know. Um, and sometimes we come up with cool names for them, and sometimes uh, one of my favorite cyberpunk characters of all time um, was a, a solo named Bob. Um, Gilbert Milner had decided that um, everybody else had all of these cool names like, you know, Star Killer or something like that. And so he was just going to be Bob the Assassin. And that's just what he did. Oh, man, the script. Because, because it was so, it was so antithetical to everything else that was going on. I mean, he, he literally tried not to be cool. You know, um, that's pretty and, cool in and of itself. So we thought yeah. so at the time as well. Um, you know, I, I haven't talked to Gilbert in years, but he, he was one of the smartest guys I've ever met um, and knew more about role-playing games than I had on my best day. He All right. So, so uh, Benjamin played Adam. Ed Bohm played, uh, played Rache Bartmos. So let's go down the list. Who, who played... Uh, who played Johnny Silverhand? That's Mike's character. Johnny was That's always Mike's character. character. You know, that makes perfect, perfect sense. Yeah. Uh, Alt is Lisa's who, character. Alt is Lisa's character. That that makes even more sense. Well, isn't Spider uh, also Lisa's? Um, uh, yes, I believe she was as well. And, and, you know, a lot of those characters from those early campaigns... You know, whether it was Thaddeus or, you know, somebody else, a lot of those names and stuff ended up, but they weren't, it wasn't like they were those characters that were playing. It was, it, it was like, um, sometimes those characters were NPCs in their other campaigns that they ran sure. and then they brought them into the, you know, things like that. So, you know, people say that I was the body model for Morgan Blackhand. Well, I wasn't the first one. 
the first one was in Chrome was the guy on the cover of Chromebook One, and I can't remember his name right now. I mean, come Solo Fortune really? One, or Solo Fortune One, yes, I'm yeah. So otherwise, I mean, that's a weird looking dude. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, who knows? And somebody said I'm entirely too chubby to play Morgan Black. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that, you know, that may have been true, but I'm, you know, I'm bigger now. So, I mean, I was, I was thin back then. I was, I was still handsome. Well, yeah, but okay. Mor Morgan uh, doesn't necessarily have to be in, in good shape. He, he was always portrayed as the smart guy, always, you know. I mean, even the art, like in later books, he's portrayed as a bigger dude. Like, yes, he, but he's bigger, like, he's bigger, like the rock and Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's not hot belly guy like like yeah you know that's that that's a different thing so so yeah you portrayed morgan blackhand on the cover of solo of fortune 2 and i gotta know you still have those fucking shades those things are badass those were not mine oh <laughs> those those um belong that coat was mine um and the clothes were mine and but the but this, the sunglasses and the gun, the gun was a prop gun from an anime series um, that Michael had. And uh, and he had the uh, the sunglasses because um, he wanted a specific style for the pictures. And we took those in the loading dock in the back of uh, RTG and it took about 10 minutes. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah, I've wondered about that for years. Um, I always thought that the gun was like a, a light gun from like a Nintendo or something, but uh... no, no, it was a, it was a prop gun, and then it had been processed. The image was processed. Um, okay, they add some stuff to the the gun itself. So, yeah. so who? So Morgan was one of uh, Mike's NPCs. Um, I've always, you know, I, he never said that to me, but I've always assumed that that was the case, especially after Cyber Generation came out. When, yeah. when he decided Morgan was going to be the point of view character for Cyber Generation, I pretty much assumed that he was just another one of Mike's characters. Got it. I mean, he, he, I, Morgan is, is Mike's baby. Like, yeah. to the point that he didn't want him to appear in 2077 as anything more than rumors. Um, there's, well, that's there's funny. a huge cult following behind, you know, what's really going on with Morgan now in, in the time of 2077. Well, yeah, he would be about um, 70. Um, I mean, even even with uh, modern geriatrics, he, he would be an old dude, you know. He would probably well, be somebody like the Finn would be. He would be almost like a fixer. I mean, Rogue's still around. Every member of Samurai is still around. Hell, Saburo Arasaka is still around in 2077. Uh, I, I believe that's not actually Saburo Arasaka. I believe that he died in 2020, but that's just a personal I, opinion. I believe I've that what you're seeing so is actually many. a series of clones. But that's just... You know, I've got so many conspiracy theories of my own about what's going on with the Saburo, with the Arasaka family, uh, that they could fill their own show. Well, I mean, one of these days we're gonna have to do that. Which book is it? Is it um, Home of the Brave or one of the Stormfronts, in which they have a picture of like all these clones, and and the section was about Arasaka, um, and kind of yeah, hinting that Yeah, I think it was. Uh, was... I actually okay. might have even been the corporate book. That might be true. Well, I mean, you know, they introduced clones in Land of the Free for a reason. Uh, and I, yeah, I in I my games, the whole once they introduced clones, you had clones, you had Soul Killer. Well, there you go. There's your Matrix form immortality. Well, it, it's funny because um, the Blade Runner role playing game just came out, um, and uh, I was reading parts of it. And I, I don't own the whole game right now, but I started writing a campaign for it. Um, and basically, um, there are two um, Blade Runners. One of them is named Maggie, and the, uh, the guy's name is Muhammad. And they're working on alternate things. And um, they're 
forced together by their captain because someone has uh, this takes place after the, the first film uh, some place someone has cited Deckard and they want somebody to go air him out hmm. so um, they're looking for Deckard and there are or, um, there are several other characters there's there's a couple of regular cops regular beat cops um, there are uh, you know a couple of party girls you know whether they're artificial or real is up for some debate um, and you know there's there's this guy named Samir who shows up and um, there's there are these people called the watchers that show up and everything and it, they go through this game um, they meet this woman named Mary who tells them that they're they're pawns in a much larger conspiracy and that they need to only trust each other and they need to be very very careful and through the end of the the campaign they they find all of these people and more than half of the people that they're asked to terminate aren't replicants oh that's a nice twist um and they they can't determine why and the end game of the campaign is that everyone ends up being a replicant <laughs> nice because everyone on earth died oh oh damn <laughs> You got some... They died of a they died of a plague, and the people in the off-world colonies tried to repopulate Earth. That's why all of the people on Earth are genetically deficient. That sounds they're, like a cool fucking because they're not perfect copies. They're not perfect copies. So you know, I, I found myself literally 25 years later, and it's funny. The day I was arrested and indicted was the day of the premiere of, of uh, Blade Runner 2049. Oh, um, shit. And I literally had to go a year and a half before I could see it. Oh, man. Um, and it was torture. Um, Blade, the original Blade Runner was the first I mean, film I ever saw a hundred times in the theater. I used to look at the movie story. You got me beat because uh, I was too young to see it when it came out. All summer between my sophomore and junior year in 1982, I went to the local theater. You could get a matinee ticket for four bucks and you could sit there all day. They didn't give a shit. Oh, man, I remember those days. Those were the best days to go to movies. (laughs) And and I... um, I saw that movie a hundred times in the theater, even with the, the voiceover that everybody hates and everything else. I, 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 love I still have some love for that version of the film. Um, for me, the theatrical but, cut is still the best cut. I don't care what anybody says. I will die on that hill. They all have their their individual their individual things, but the the ideas that you know you see there still resonate. Yeah, forty years later. I mean, it's just—it's a masterwork. It well, no, and you see, you know, like, um, have you ever seen Wings? Yeah, nineteen twenty-seven, first film to ever be nominated for the Academy Award. If you watch any fighter pilot movie since nineteen twenty-seven, you will see at least three shots ripped off from Wings. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from Star Wars, all the trench fighting scenes. Yeah, Star Wars. Top Gun, every single movie with pilots in it is ripped off from Wings. They, it's, all of the gags are there. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, but the themes that are in, you know, this campaign that I'm writing and, um, you know, the, the most of the NPCs are named after angels and um, 
figures from the Book of Enoch in the Ethiopian Bible um, just because I needed something else to... I needed to find some non-Western names for things, and I started listening to the stuff on YouTube. Anyway, it's a long story, but um, you can still make a game of it now with Blade Runner. But, you know, Cyberpunk 2020, in a lot of ways, is an anachronism. Um, it's, even though you can have fun, there has to be a lot of suspension of disbelief because it's an obsolete future. Yep. Yeah, if you run it straight out of the book, it, it is very much an obsolete future. Yeah, uh, I, I just want to interrupt one thing. Um, so Ross sure. um, Ock Raven on uh, Twitch says, thank you, Ross, for your contribution to Cyberpunk. It's awesome to meet an iconic person that helped stem such enjoyment for years and years just to give you some here here well that's a very kind thing to say you know i i think if this had video he might not be as excited to meet me but um <laughs> well he wouldn't be excited to meet any of we're us we're all we, a bunch of fat old men so i think we have <laughs> faces for radio let's just say yeah. as much as my as much as my partner would disagree i think i have a face for radio um and that's about it so um you know it's funny because, and there are other games that have a lot of obsolete future elements to them. Um, a couple of years ago, um, Mongoose got the license for Traveler, which is, um, the, it was the second game I ever played. In 1977, I played uh, Dungeons and Dragons because I got a copy for my 11th birthday. And, uh, and we used to go to this place called Hobby Town in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and in the basement, they would have role-playing games. And one day they didn't have a D&D &D game. They said, well, let's play Traveler. And so I did, and I, I thought it was fantastic. And um, at one point in my life, I owned 14 of the 15 versions of Traveler that were available. <laughs> and uh, I was really excited about, about Mongoose's Traveler and uh, when my uh, we, they have a limited edition leatherette bound hardback with like aluminum corners and all this stuff mm -hmm. and um, my amazing partner got me that for christmas and uh actually for my birthday she just uh, she gave me a card and a pdf of the new version of high guard um which is their naval supplement and uh, as well um and so i'm pretty stoked about that and then i realized i'm gonna have to by the other two limited editions, so I have all four books that look the same. But anyway, um, that's the way that goes. Yeah, I mean that's. But I mean, a lot of the things about because I mean, Traveler was written in the seventies, and they were talking about E.C. Tubbs' The Doomer Saga and uh, Star Viking, and you know the works of H.B. Piper um, and all that stuff, and. And they were talking about the age of sail and the 18th century and, and all of this stuff. And, you know, the speed of communications being the yeah, speed I mean, of transport. They were trying to do Star Trek, basically. Well, no, actually, even even before that, they were really trying to do uh, Doom Rest of Terra. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and Traveler still does that great. And, and honestly, there is no setting in all of role-playing games that can compare to the third imperium it's massive and it's you know thousands of pages and all kinds of cool stuff written about it but you know it can be difficult or it can be challenging to figure out what you're going to keep and what you're going to leave if you want to run a more modern traveler game um That's i have some ideas and i think i'm going to try it this year but who knows cool so, so that means you're still with any uh, Sorry. science fiction game is eventually the science outpaces the fiction. Well, and but and and yet there is some that does not. I think, for instance, um, as much as some of the movies have been pretty horrible, I think there's a lot of legs to the Terminator idea. I think that oh yeah, you know the the idea of multiple timelines and 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 travel and and 
human resistance and you know all of that stuff you know that's pretty awesome um and i think you know there's still a place for stuff like the fifth element um and i think that you know that kind of stuff doesn't age and you know i i just think that there you reach a level well i mean they work some things they go don't, past it they don't, don't try to science you know, they're faster than light travel. It just exists. They don't explain it. They don't try and, you know, yeah. let you know how it gotta, works. It just is there. Yeah. So you accept. Well, right yeah, now. I got to push in, my uh, things through the gate kind of thing. Yeah. So so right now I'm I'm actually running a, a high rider campaign for 2020. Um, and, and trying to, you know, bring a little more hard science into it. But just the idea of, you know, the, there's always that kind of disbelief when, when it comes to the players of like, well, this that doesn't exist now. How could it possibly exist in, in 2020, right? Because we're past 2020. And it's like, well, the, the timeline diverged. And, and the whole concept of, of the 2020 line is, okay, well space was actually invested a lot more back in the you know 80s and 90s and early 2000s to bring about the yeah. space age as opposed to what happened with us was yeah we got a shuttle <laughs> you know yeah we did a little bit of stuff but that whole investment well, of, yeah, of the we, money we always assumed we always assumed that the break with reality was in 1990 yeah. That's, you know, when we were working on the game at that time and in 19, because that allowed the, the Soviet Union to still exist, even though it was fractured and had other problems that allowed um, private investment in the space and to have some kind of a, an orbitable presence and, you know, by 2020 and, and other things like that. So, I mean, yeah, you have to, as a matter of fact, was it, what was that thing called the Delta Clipper? Yep. Yeah, the, 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 Del the Delta Clipper was a single stage to orbit aircraft that was designed and one of the components to the Delta Clipper was a radar system from an F-4 Phantom. <laughs> That's what it used as its radar it was at that time a 30 year old unit that was being put into this new um, you know, and there's a lot of pieces of technology like that that were able to be built at different times. Like, you know, when Elon Musk uh, bought SpaceX, because he didn't start it, he bought it after from the well, uh, yeah. the engineers, Elon Musk. the the engineers that founded the company. Their biggest problem was realizing that no one could replicate the pro process of the rocket dyne motors that NASA built in the '60s because that. That technology no longer existed and they couldn't reverse engineer it because all the guys that worked on it were too old yeah so they had to figure out a new way to make new engines that were both more reusable and um and less fragile more efficient yeah yeah, yeah. well even just so, I mean, to, all kinds of stuff like that. to the issue um that happened over in ohio the tragedy um with the train and, and finding out, oh, the, the brake systems on those trains are from, like, the Civil War. It's like, what? <laughs> my, my That's great the technology? Uncle, um, his, yeah, my great uncle, his name was Nick Wolf. Um, in the 30s and 40s, he was the chairman of Atlas Railroad Brakes. They were the only manufacturer of railroad brakes on the planet. Um, and uh, he, he built railroads in other countries and did all these other things but yeah the the brake system on a rail car has not been substantially redesigned since at least the 50s yeah um, and maybe further back than that so yeah because the standard line of thinking is if it, if it works it works yeah, if it ain't well, broke don't fix it <laughs> yeah well there's a huge infrastructure with trains and you know you have to retrain an entire work Course, you have to maybe recalibrate the way the tracks are laid and everything. That's a huge capital investment. You've got yeah, to be careful about how you change things. 
You yeah. can't go back and rip up all those tracks and expect, you know, commerce to continue. True. No, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, just so you're aware, me and, me and Derek um, usually go off on diatribes, but sometimes we need to <laughs> rope back and get back into uh, the normal s- <laughs> the, 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 the topic at hand, which is usually cyberpunk. Um, so from my understanding, you've had quite a, a bit of experience prior to cyberpunk. You mentioned a little bit of it with uh, Twilight 2000. Uh, so I heard you were actually in a campaign in which a lot of the supplements or, or adventures for Twilight 2000 uh, kind of, two, two of them actually. published. Um, yeah, yeah, two of them actually. Um, I used to play in a group um, at the University of South Florida. Um, we used to meet in room 343 in Cooper Hall, which was the Arts and Letters building. It's It's been torn down. But, um, and uh, I had met a guy when I was 13. His name is Frank Fry, and he was a... Um, he was a veteran, uh, is a veteran, and he's still with us. And um, he uh, he loved Moral Project and Traveler and, and all of these other games. And we played Danger International and we played uh, we played Lance of Mystery. And, um, we played uh, Justice Incorporated and Hero System and all these other things. And um, he wrote uh, the RDF source book for Game Design Workshop. Um, and, yeah, and... Um, that was basically the Middle East for Twilight 2000. Um, yeah. And we played in two or three different campaigns, different parts of which ended up in different books um, for Game Design Workshop. Um, and in Largo, which is across the bay from Tampa, where USF is, um, we had an adventurer's guild in Largo, and I met a guy there named Tom Mulkey. Um, and Tom ended up writing um, Gateway to the Spanish Main, which was um, the USS Constitution um, after Twilight 2000. Um, a bunch of a bunch of renegades I love for that book. steal the USS Constitution and become pirates on the Spanish Main. A um, couple of things that didn't make it into that book as published. Um, our cabin boy was named Willie, um, and uh, the reason he was the cabin boy is because it was Prince William, and he was living in incognito <laughs> so that he wouldn't be assassinated. <laughs> in awesome. the UK. Um, so I played in in Tom's. So he played, uh, can't wait in Spanish. I mean, uh, the second one was called the Last University, which was basically. Um, the University of Florida had managed to maintain some semblance of order um, in the uh, in the state and was a, a center for uh, pe- helping people get fed and clothed and housed and all that stuff. Um, and then uh, there was a third adventure as well, and the name escapes me right now. So yeah. um, Tom was a great help to me when I started writing, um, and this is before I started writing for. Uh, for RTG, and then uh, so was Frank, um, and, uh, and it, you know, Tom. Uh, Tom had some psychological challenges and some physical challenges, and he passed away some years ago. But uh, Frank is still with us, uh, as grouchy as always, and you can find him on Facebook. Um, That's awesome! And, I need uh, to find him. Uh, just look for Frank Fry, um, and uh, Frank and I'm Fry. sure you will find him. And uh, he was, you know, eventually among the other things he wrote, he eventually wrote Tales from the Forlorn Hope for Cyberpunk. Yep. Uh, and yeah, uh, I definitely need to find him because, I mean, yeah. obviously we love that adventure, that that whole book. So yeah, um, and it's funny because he. Uh, I mean, he used to bust my ass for a lot of things, and probably still does. But um, he used to bust my ass. And says, you know, I, I wrote for Cyberpunk before you did, um, and uh, we had a great weekend with. Um, oh man, what's his name? 
RL. It's a science fiction writer who passed away. He uh, wrote one oh, uh, uh, Effinger. Yes, George Alec Effinger Alec was Effinger. the guest of honor. He was the I, guest I, I of honor. I found out uh, that he wrote comics too. Yeah, he was a guest of honor at Necronomicon, and uh, because I was um, affiliated with the cyberpunk role-playing game, and so was uh, Frank, we were given the um, incredible burden of hanging out with George all weekend. Oh, yeah, that sounds was, horrible. I mean, oh, my God. Yeah, that's a, awful. A, a, a more well-read erudite funny intellectually quick person i don't think i have ever ever met in i my mean when life. gravity when gravity fails that that whole trilogy the marin trilogy is is just so fantastic it, it brought so many elements that no one would have ever thought to bring in to you know the cyberpunk universe or the the cyberpunk genre i mean he was so groundbreaking and so ahead of his time like trans characters are just all throughout the book. The whole thing is based in the Middle East. It's none of it seems oh, ab- judgmental or cliche. No, no, and it's it's funny too because um, Walter John Williams, um, who wrote Hardwired, among other fantastic books, uh, please go to Amazon and Kindle and all that stuff and go buy them and read them. They're wonderful, um, as well Second as if minute. you have a go go read all of George Alec. But um, the two of them decided that they were going to take uh, Hardwired and the Budayin and put them in the same universe. Um, And uh, it was uh, seeing the two of them go at it and try and come up with ideas about how that would work and everything was really phenomenal. Man, Um, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in that session. Oh, absolutely. Although the most fun conversation I ever took part in was at DragonCon in 1996, 1995, I can't remember. Um, The guest of honor was supposed to be Tim Leary and he had just died. Oh. Um, But it was Bruce Sterling, John Shirley. Oh my God. Steve Brown, who was the editor of Science Fiction I, who actually published most cyberpunk, early cyberpunk literature before it got picked up by other magazines. Um, and uh, and they decided, so somebody introduces me to Bruce, and I don't realize who it is. I just turn around. And somebody says, oh, Ross, this is Bruce Sterling. And I just, I don't fucking <laughs> say a thing. Drop. And the guy says, uh, so what the hell do you do? And I said, I write for a cyberpunk role-playing game. And he says, really? It's not the one with the fucking elves, is it? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> he said, okay, well, you're all right with me. Come on over here. <laughs> um, and uh, we had about a three-hour conversation Um we were standing on the mezzanine of the Hilton and Towers in Atlanta. Um, Guar was getting ready to go on. Guar and... was at Dragon Con? Oh, yeah, they were at Dragon Con for years. They used to come every year. But um, I don't know if they that still do. But, um, well, probably not. So uh, Bruce, or no, John Shirley was carrying his guitar because his band, the Panther Moderns, was supposed to open for them. Um and so we sat around and talked about um they found out i was from clearwater area um so we talked about l ron hubbard um we talked about (laughs) tim leary because he had just passed um we talked about um the fact that we thought the country was going to hell in a handbasket um this was in 96 nothing and this 95 or 96 I, if you look it up in, in the dragon con archives i'm sure it'll tell you which one it was but um and other people kept walking up to us um and just i i've never 
experienced this before. I didn't experience it when I was talking to Tom Clancy or when I was talking to CJ Cherry or different people that I'd met at different conventions when I had a guest badge on. The people who are creators and artists and stuff like that, they, they give you a different kind of respect than if you just have an attendee badge. Um, right. But I'd never had that happen where people would come up and they would orbit and they would just walk away. They just wanted to hear some of the conversation. Um, they didn't necessarily want to interrupt anybody and they or, or they were too gobsmacked to want to talk to anybody or anything. Um, Bruce was a, a fantastic person, incredibly gracious. Um, and uh, it was about 25 or 30 minutes into the conversation before I could actually speak speak to him directly. I could talk to John Shirley almost immediately. He was very approachable. Um, Steve Brown was also just a guy or whatever, but I had had, I had so many fanboy feelings for Bruce Sterling and um, he had written so many things that I thought were important. It was very difficult for me to get past that. I eventually did and we had a very nice conversation and I went to a reading of his the next day. Um, uh, John Shirley sent me uh, an autographed copy of one of his books, as did Bruce, um, and uh, that was just a, that was pretty much, a, that may have been the best day ever, um, as far as, as, just the fact that they would accept the fact that I was a writer just because they said so, never having read any of my stuff, was pretty amazing. Well, I, I just think it's that hilarious that Bruce Sterling knew, you know, the the role playing elements of, of cyberpunk and, and was able to call out, you know, oh, is that <laughs> the one, the with, one the, with, the with the elves? <laughs> yes, yes, um, that was that was very. He didn't know it was called Shadowrun, but at least he knew he didn't want to see no elves. Amen to that. I mean, I, I'll be perfectly honest. You were the you were the first. Uh, professional writer for our Talsorian games that I'd ever talked to. And I had kind of that same moment when we started talking where I was just kind of, I didn't know what to say to you. I was gobsmacked that you were talking to me. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you for taking your uh, the time out to, you know, let me bounce ideas off of you back in the day. And I'm very Dear grateful Lord. for the friendship that we have uh, that we have had. You're very welcome. I, uh, you know, it, it's funny because I, I, Derek and I chatted briefly um, yesterday about this. And, you know, I said, just, you know, be kind. It's been 25 years. I'm old. Um, I mean, when I started writing, I was, you know, 24 years old. And I'm 57 now. That's a long time. Um, and I don't remember, I got, I got 12 years of addiction in there. I got, I got jail, I got rehab, I got a bunch of other stuff and I got recovery and everything else. I don't remember things as well as I used to, but, um, I, I will say this, um, the people that I worked with at Artel Sorian, many of whom are still friends today, are probably the best group of people that anyone could have wished for to be working on a project in any role-playing game at that time. There's a lot of talent and a lot of people. And I, I don't think, to this day, I don't think I would be as good if it wasn't for Benjamin. I don't think I would be as good if it wasn't for, for Gilbert or for Chris Williams or for Mike or for anybody else because, um, oh hell, even Janice Sellers, she was my editor for the whole time I was with RTG. You know, she taught me tons. Um, we're very fortunate and, uh, and at the end of the day, we're just folks. We just happen to have a better idea than anybody else wow. before they did. And then the next guy came up and had a better idea before we did. Yeah. I mean, you guys are damn good folks. I'll say that. I, uh, over the years I've managed to accrue several of the, you know, RTG guys as, you know, first just you know contacts on social media or whatever but i'd like to think that i've become 
at least fairly good online friends with a lot of them. Uh, um, Benjamin Wright, he's a, he's a fantastic. They're all fantastic yeah. people. Um, but Benjamin was very... almost going to be here tonight. He is unfortunately stuck on a conference call at work until about, well, about now actually was when he was supposed to get off of his conference call. But um, but he's in, you know, I'm I'm out here in in Florida and he's in California, so he's three hours behind us. Um, so he's just getting off of work, but, uh, but I'm sure you can get him on the phone. Yeah, that's, we will. I, he is definitely <laughs> on my list of people that I, I very much want to get on the show. Um, it's having that extra connection is, is awesome. I love that you're still close to all these people. Um, well, you that, know, I, when I went away, when I came back, um, a lot of those people were the very first people to reach out to me. I and a lot that. of those people, were the very first people to say, my uncle, my cousin, my brother, my sister, whatever, has struggled with addiction. We're with you 100% of the way. Is there anything we can do to help? And, I you know, I've seen some of those people in 20 years. But we've talked online and and to have that kind of a to have that kind of a, a support a warmth or, or a connection to those people is something i feel very very grateful for yeah yeah i mean i mean i i i believe it completely when uh when my mom died last year uh several of them you know reached out to me to make sure i was doing okay including benjamin and uh hawk about and you know it, 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 they're just all fantastic people. Yeah, and it's good Mike. to know that <laughs> that the future is not so dystopian as you think. That there's always people around you who who can show you some compassion. Well, I think I I think that's I mean I think that's something that I I always found to be the case in my campaigns and series. Um, you know, about halfway through. Uh, cyberpunk is when I stopped really calling um, calling them campaigns and started calling them series because I started visualizing them like television series but you know yeah exactly no that's, what, that's the way I look at it no matter what technology you face no matter what dehumanizing forces there are in the world and there are plenty in the world right now amen um, it doesn't need to be the future the the human connection and the ability of people to find meaning in personal relationships regardless of the technology around them is the reason that we do this and hopefully yeah. it can continue yeah because i mean at the end of the day, if you, you tell a story that doesn't have any hope in it, you're not telling a good story. You're not telling anything I want to read anyway. It's, hope is, no matter how bad things get, if, if there's if there's hope, there's something to latch on to. There's something to connect with. Yep. So, before we continue, I, I, I just don't want to, you know, <laughs> um, interrupt your time too much, uh, Ross, but usually uh, we do about two hours, so we're about a the hour 10 mark um okay. so i just don't know if you have any need need to leave soon or, or what's going on but if you want we can continue chatting um just want to make sure I am, that you're good. i'm actually yeah i i had not planned on being here more than an hour and i've had an incredibly busy day so if you guys don't mind i'm gonna bow out but but um I want to say that I've enjoyed talking to both of you. I hope that uh, that you have all the success and that you continue. And who knows? Um, maybe you'll have to send me a check at some point for twenty five cents. <laughs> um, would you? Uh, we, we would love to have you back um, because I think we still have a absolutely. few more questions. Um, maybe in a couple months, um, if you're available, we appreciate definitely appreciate your time and, and glad you shared. A bunch of your stories with us and our audience 
Uh, you are very welcome, and uh, I, please just let me know, and uh, and I will be there soon. If you have time, I, I have one more question that I feel I'd be remit if I didn't ask. Okay. Uh, Neo tribes. There's a there's a section of the book that is has become rather controversial. Um, it's just a little small small bit, but people keep posting it and taking it out of what I see is taking it out of context. Uh, the bit about the bit about diversity, um, if that lets you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's been a while. We, um, I haven't. I haven't owned a copy of that book in about six years. Um, so okay. can you read me the? I can't. But I mean, uh, the okay. diversity and unity. It is now accepted uh, uh, among historical scholars that in the decades before the collapse, America suffered from the sicknesses of racism and cultural cultural identity. Everyone, everybody wanted to be seen as special. Every group had to be equal or preferably better than its neighbors and fought to protect its special rights. If anyone had something that someone else wanted, they were painted as racist, sexist, elitist, or worse. The divisive me-first attitude eventually tore the fabric of American culture apart and caused it to self-destruct in a fireball of competing ideologies, none of which truly recognized each other's validity. Diversity led inexorably to anarchy. In contrast, the key to the survival of nomad culture has always been unity. The nomads understood that they are nomads first. All the cultural identity in the world will not save them if they do not help each other. Their common condition ensures few disagreements or cultural issues. Where once members of the Joes and Alcala clans almost went to war over the reconstruction rights for Los Angeles, there is now a bidding etiquette and compensation for losing parties. Where once the Meta and the Bloods feuded over limited medical resources, they now share resources like the library and Medici. Their shared ideals and common hardships have made the nomads form a unique culture, one secure enough to allow differences in variety and keep it strong. Um, it's really yeah. that first part where, you know, diversity inexorably led to anarchy. Uh, what were you trying to say with that? Because a lot of the all Well, I think it's very, I think that's, that's a great question because I think it's very true in America today. And it's funny to me that I wrote that so long ago. So, um, you remember Syndrome in The Incredibles? Yes. If everybody's special, then nobody's special. And the idea that we all have differences. In the 50s, there used to be this ad that was in the back of comic books. And it was a bunch of kids standing around Superman. And he said, you know, don't let people tell you to hate people of different races or different religions because that's not American. And that's what we deal with every day. We deal with people who deal in divisiveness, not in unity. I really think that it, I was talking to my partner today and we were sitting in the car listening to, you know, uh, what's her name, Haley running for president um if you're going to preach divisiveness i think you're ultimately going to fail you're going to tear america apart the only thing that's going to bring us together is realizing that we have more in common than we have, have separate that we can move together or we can move apart it is completely up to us it's important that we acknowledge that people are not the same but it's also important to acknowledge that we have a lot of the same goals. You know, we want to be happy. We want to have a relationship. We want to have children. We want to have food. We want to have places to live, medical care, education. All of those things are common goals that most people in American society today would probably enjoy. But People are going to tell them they have to go in a million different directions and they all have to be special because that keeps them separate. And by keeping them separate, the powers that be, whomever they are, keep them manageable. All right. So, so it's a distraction tool for the people in power to keep power is what you were getting at. I, well, I mean, whether it's, whether it's, and, and here's, you know, Alan Moore said this. He said, you know, it's easier to believe in conspiracy theories 
because it's terrifying to admit, and I'm paraphrasing, that the world is rudderless and we are all at sea and we are all going mad. I don't know if it's the powers that be. Right. I don't know if it's human nature. I don't know what it is, but I know that something is trying to keep us apart. And for many years in America, mm -hmm. about 160 years, to be perfectly honest, we were able to realize that we were a nation that was stronger together for our diversity. And we don't we don't believe that anymore. These days, we believe that diversity harms us. At least a lot of people do. And I think that's sad. Yeah. I do too. And I think it's it's sad that a lot of those people are using that first paragraph uh, as a means to in, in opposite of what you're trying to say. They're, they're using it as a means to say that diversity is wrong and that uh, recognizing all other cultures and identities and people celebrating those is wrong. You can uh, believe that trans people <laughs> have a place in this society and get gay people and straight people and poly people and monogamous people. All of these people, you can believe all of them have a place in this society. And you can also believe in a larger society. Yeah, you can absolutely. be and still be part of a greater whole. You know, like my family. Uh, <clears throat> very different people but we're part of a greater whole. that's okay um we're part of a greater whole and that's important and i think that's that very very true and uh we have, we have forgotten that. that in america and I, and i think that's that's sad because if you go to other places in the world that's not the case i have friends that live in croatia i have friends you know I'm not just a cover model on Solo of Fortune 2020. By the way. <laughs> I'm an international cover model. I was also on the covers in Poland and Germany and a couple of other places as well. So, you know, let my let my rates, my hourly rates reflect that. I, I am an international cover model. Okay, so it's 35 so, um, cents now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> 35 <laughs> cents is wonderful. So, but no, but we really have, you know, those people um yeah. i mean america um, a melting pot is always going to be better than than trying to keep everything separate well, i mean that's and when was the last time you politician used that word uh they're afraid of that word today yeah they're terrified of that word because because they don't they're not looking to unify. No, I they're... believe they're looking to divide because, you know, everybody wants to be, you know, when when uh, Mandela um, in 1991, I was at um, it was the first weekend I ever met Mike and Lisa. Um, I was at uh, Atlanta again um, for Dragon Con. And uh, I came out of our hotel and we we're walking down the street and there are snipers in buildings all over the place. And I'm like, what in the hell is like police snipers? And uh, and there we walk up to the hotel and there's three limos. The two of them are brand new uh, Lincoln Town Car and this Cadillac. That was like from the early 80s. And I'm like, that's really weird. And I turn around and I run into this guy. And he was about five foot six. But it was like hitting a wall. And I'm six four. So I, I was hitting a wall and I almost fell backwards. And he actually grabbed me by the front of my shirt and held me until I got my footing underneath me. And standing behind him was Nelson Mandela. Oh, that's very cool. The most famous, and I, I just said, you know, and Winnie Mandela was there as well. And I had seen her speak at University of South Florida. Um, and I mentioned that to her and I said, excuse me. And he said, excuse me. 
and uh, they went about their business and, and we went into the convention. But um, when when Mandela got out of prison and he um, eventually becomes president of South Africa, there were a lot of people in his country who were part of the the, the black apartheid power structure who were yeah. not interested in unification because they would lose their governing authority. Think about how messed up that has to be. Well, and yeah, that's how I, bad mean... I think it is in the United States right now. Like if you, your family has been systemically oppressed for three generations and you say, well, you know, at least now I got a nice house. Yeah, there's 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 way too much of that going on here in America. Yeah, name any there names is. at the moment, but it's it's endemic. It's. I would love to see a moderate Republican, a Jack Kemp, um, somebody like uh, like Mitt Romney, um, and not the Mitt Romney who ran for president a few years ago, by the way, the Mitt Romney who ran for, and won government of Mass governor of Massachusetts. Yep. That guy was a moderate. He yeah, was, I would have liked to have really, seen a, uh, like a 1998 era John McCain. Uh, before he you lost know, his mind. This, you know, I my family was I was raised a Republican and I voted for Reagan in in 1984. And you know, I have to say, you know, my my grandparents were Goldwater Republicans. And, you know, what Goldwater said was, don't ever let the uh, the church get a hold of the Republican Party, because if they if they do, oh, they yeah. will destroy everything we've ever built. And that is exactly what has happened. Well, <laughs> you know, he was he was a very, very smart man. He, I mean, he was never, you can't even find anything. moderate Democrats anymore. It's just... Uh, Every yeah. like even the Democratic Party is 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 right. I think, I think <laughs> Obama. I think Obama was a pretty moderate Democrat, but you yeah. know, not to range too yeah. far into politics. But yeah, no, I was about to say let's let's rein it back because uh, you know I think our podcast is not you know, necessarily getting into politics. I know everyone on this yeah, call, I'm sure, has that. strong opinions, and me and Derek have talked sure. quite a bit. What about we it, need but, to do. <laughs> What, what I wanted to do then, and remember, I wrote this 25 years ago. I was talking about the melting pot. I was talking about the idea that America needs to come together because I felt that the divisions in American society were getting too large. Um, and that directly affected what I was writing in um, Neo Tribes, which is, by the way, the book I wrote that I am the most proud of. It is um, my favorite. And, and, it is my favorite cyberpunk supplement, uh, and I have never made any bones about that. That's well, yeah. Wild, so, wild mean, side is uh, always going to be mine, but that's that's another thing. I mean, no, wild side number two, but neo tribes. And, uh, but guys. you know, I think that there is something to be said for the fact that you know we all need to come together, whether we're you know. Hey, my dad's got a barn, kids. Let's go put on a show like our gang in the 30s. All the way through to now, you know, there's a lot of opportunities we have for unity and making things better. And I felt that it was, we had strayed too far from that in 1990. Now think about what it is today. It's a massive change, sea change in the way that America works. And I think it's too bad. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to get on board with that all right so in any case um i know you gotta leave i hope you gentlemen have a fantastic day uh, i uh i look forward uh, to hearing from you and um and we can do this again yep great absolutely thank you so thank much you. for talking with us yes today, well. thank you um is there anything that uh our audience should be looking out from you i know you wrote a novel about 10 years ago um I did, um, and, and it's still available on Amazon. It's called uh, Into the no, Wedding. <laughs> Man, I just I blanked on my own away. novel. Um, yeah, it's really painful for people who know me to read that book. Um, 
that book is absurdly autobiographical and um and never wanted to quit thank you um never wanted oh, yeah, to quit. three hundred dollars yeah um never want to quit a novel about women um and uh my partner read it and she said please don't ever make me read that again um <laughs> it was written, i was in a i was in a really dark place i was full on in my addiction when i wrote that and uh it's uh it's very difficult for me but as far as other writing is concerned um i have considered it and uh the possibility remains uh that i may choose to do something in the future but for right now I'm going to concentrate on uh, on my family and on my recovery and uh, hopefully find a game to play around here sometime soon. It seems like in uh, in the Tampa Bay area, at least, it's uh, it's very difficult to find a group to play a, a real game in person anymore, unless it has cards in it. Yeah. yeah. People like simple and quick. But I yeah. tell you what, man, uh, you're always welcome <laughs> in any game I'm running. So there's that. It'll be online, but. I understand. Well, thank you, gentlemen, and I hope you have a fantastic thank day. You. Appreciate All it. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Have a great night. All right. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, that was that was the uh, Ross Spike yes. Lynn, and we are the main man. We're so who, uh, lucky to have him here tonight. Yeah, wrote quite a bit of uh, several folklore, so we appreciate him joining. Um, I know we're about half an hour early on quitting, but um, yeah. I, I don't know how we can follow that up. I don't know how we can follow that up either. So appreciate everyone joining us. Um, you can check me out. Uh, I maintain a site called cybersmiley.net. Um, has a bunch of utilities for uh, Cyberpunk 2020 as well as Red. Um, right now i'm doing a bunch of bug fixes for that site so dealing with that uh you can always find me on various discord uh channels um so if you at cyber smiley on like our talsorian or cyber nation uncensored or even go to my own um discord uh server i am available if you want to chat talk have questions etc by all means reach out to me I am Derek Bernier, otherwise known as Wisdom000. I run Data Fortress 2020, which uh, it might have. If, if you play Cyberpunk 2020, you might you might find a thing or two there worth 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 your time. Um, we've got rules, we've got source books, we've got gear. Uh, you want lore? Go there. <laughs> There's yeah, tons lore, of lore. Go there. It's, it's got an archive of. Not all, but most of the Cyberpunk 2020 sites that ever existed. Um, I, yeah, there'll there'll be something there for you. Um, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, I I uh, run the Data Fortress 2020 group. I'm a mod of the Cyberpunk 2020 group. Um, I'm part of Cybernation and Censored. Uh, I I I cruise Reddit. Um, not, not so much on Discord, although I am here, obviously, because that's what we record through. Uh, but yeah, if you have questions, comments, suggestions, uh, you can you can get a hold of us through any of these means, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Yep, and we'll see you next time in two weeks, first week of uh, March. Oh, yeah, always um, as always, thank you, yep. Cyber Nation Uncensored, for hosting us. Also, just an uh, FYI, I am actually going to be running some two cyberpunk events at TotalCon uh, next week. Uh, TotalCon is a me. yes, it's a uh, gaming convention up in uh, Massachusetts, um, held every year. I usually make go there every year, so um, if you ever want to uh, hang out and play some cyberpunk, you can always go there. Uh, I know Mike used to run games there, not so much lately, I think since the COVIDs, but uh, you never know. Maybe maybe in the in next year or in the coming years, he'll, he'll start attending again. So anyways, that's it. That's our show. And uh, we'll check you guys out uh, beginning of March. Have a good one. Absolutely. Bye.
Sacrimation Ancestor. 